Good evening. My name is Quentin Wilt uh, with the League of Women Voters Houston. Uh, welcome to Public Affairs Public Access, a monthly show hosted by the League of Women Voters Houston. In this episode of Public Affairs Public Access, we're going to talk about mobility Houston and transportation policy. Uh, joining us in the discussion this evening, we have with us uh, Thomas Visco of Glasshouse Policy, uh, Houston City Council Member at Large, Chris Robinson. David Robinson. David Robinson, sorry. <laughs> And uh, Michael Payne of Bike Houston. Good evening. Um, and I would also like to invite you at home uh, to participate in the conversation as well. Uh, you can call in the live number. It is 713-807-1794. 713-807-1794. Um, and um, I just kind of like to dis uh, start this discussion uh, with uh, Thomas Visco, if you could. Uh, we're just going to go around and uh, just introduce yourself and tell yeah. us a little bit about the organizations that you represent. Absolutely. Uh, so my name is Thomas Visco. I am the policy director of Glasshouse Policy. I'm excited to be here with all of you this evening talking about these important issues. And what we're here to talk about from Glasshouse Policy is Mobility Houston. Uh, Mobility Houston is going to be a six to eight month long community engagement initiative, the likes of which Houston has never really seen. It was going to be a combination of online and in-person opportunities through mobilityhouston.com and, and many, many public events where we will be taking input from Houstonians uh, across the city and across the region about how Houstonians think their mobility can improve, be it uh, commuting issues or public transit issues and so on. And we'll be taking all of that community feedback and filtering it to folks like Michael Payne and, and council member here so that we can build up a, a better understanding and a shared understanding of what mobility challenges and mobility priorities look like from the general public here in the Houston region. Okay. Michael? Great. Thanks. Uh, my name is Michael Payne. I'm the executive director of Bike Houston. It's my pleasure to be here this evening with, with uh, all three of you uh, discussing these topics. And Bike Houston is a nonprofit organization working to represent the interests of, of people who ride bicycles, people who want to ride bicycles, and, and, uh, and people who believe that riding bicycles are, are part of our rights in, in the greater Houston area. And um, we are working hard to make it safer for, for all sorts of people across all neighborhoods, all types of riders, um, riding for all different reasons to use their bicycles um, every day of the year and, and to do so with, with pleasure in a low stress, in a low stress manner. So we, we're very excited about what's happening in Houston, about Mayor Turner, his election, and um, looking forward to discussing it all with you tonight. Okay. And council member? Quentin, it's good to be with you, uh, Tom. And Michael, it's good to be with you as well. And uh, for you at home, my name is David Robinson. I am city council member um, at large position two. It's uh, my second term. I've just been reelected, and that is uh, citywide, all 640 square miles of uh, Houston and uh, 11 districts. And I think that really is perhaps the emphasis that I'm going to make this evening is the importance of the bike plan and mobility to truly reach all corners of Houston. And uh, I think in my first term and going on uh, my third year now, we're, we're pleased that, um, to have been involved with various committees um, working for citizens in the city of Houston, including uh, the Quality of Life Committee that I'm uh, currently vice chair of, and that has uh, uh, yet to be reapproved by Mayor Turner in the way that he will uh, decide how committee structure will be going forward in his administration. But I think given some of the attention that we've had on policy issues, including a uh, good deal of funding and uh, kick off with the Bike Plan Houston, uh, which is an initiative in its early stages and it, we expect to be uh, coming forth this spring. Uh, there is a tremendous amount to be gained from collaboration across jurisdictions and as much as I've worked before with Michael and eager to work with Tom, I think this is a wonderful opportunity and a great time for us to be speaking. It's great to be with you. Thank you. 
So let's talk a little bit about uh, Mobility Houston. Uh, that's uh, one half of the segment. Uh, and I know that's something that uh, you, Frank, is uh, you're very, I guess, uh, close to. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about that and yeah. how this initiative uh, is key uh, for developing uh, future projects and uh, with regards to transportation in and around the Houston area? Absolutely. So Glasshouse Policy is a community engagement organization and a crowdsourced think tank. What we care about is getting people involved in a policymaking conversation in a substantive and meaningful way where their ideas can actually add on to the existing policy conversation that is happening in offices like Bike Houston's and in City Hall every single day. And what Mobility Houston will be is essentially an online and in-person conversation where all Houstonians from inside the city limits as, as well as from the region are able to get online or come to our events and propose how they would solve discrete issues that Houstonians face in terms of transportation, be that traffic on their morning commute or unsafe uh, bike lanes or, or bike access or any of other of these, these myriad issues that we know about. And we really want Mobility Houston to be a, a big tent. Council member, you talked about collaboration across all of these different groups. And I think Mobility Houston Houston is specifically designed to allow people from disparate walks of life, from various bureaucracies and institutions across Houston to, to come together in one shared space and, and establish what shared expectations and priorities look like in the mobility policy realm for the Houston region. Um, so it's, it's live now, mobilityhouston.com. People can go to it and, and start talking right away. And uh, we already have many people online talking. And uh, January 29th, we'll be officially launching with a, with a large public event that we're excited to be announcing in, in probably the next week or so. Um, so. So we're looking forward to the conversation. And we're also very happy to have groups like Bike Houston working with us to make sure that we are reaching all of those corners of Houston and making sure that all of your constituents and, and the general public from the Houston region is really able to come together and have a comprehensive conversation about what they want mobility to look like in Houston in one year, in five years, and in 10 years. Really have that visionary conversation. So with Mobility Houston, and I'll, I'll repeat it again, it's mobilityhouston.com. Um, with that, that platform for mm -hmm. people to go and engage, uh, how do you feel that uh, with Bike Houston, that, that'll help to, to move and, and to sway uh, the public into ideas and um, and things that are crucial to bike use. Yeah, that is a great question, Quentin. We're uh, we're very excited about the the potential of this tool and, and the use of technology to to drive change and drive evolution in our community and our society. And it, you know, if you stop for a moment and you just step back from the picture and you and you zoom out to thirty seven thousand feet or whatever your your metaphor is, we are a city of six point two million people. Um, we are a city which has evolved since the and has grown rapidly over over the you know the last hundred years since the the invention of the automobile. Um, we've been dominated by the single occupancy vehicle as as a primary tool of transportation. But we're now at a point in our evolution where densities are going up rapidly in our city. They're tearing down apartment buildings. They're being permitted to build new buildings uh, with three times the capacity. The right-of-ways are not getting any larger, right? So we know that congestion is in our future. The question is, how bad will the congestion be? And will we take steps to create a transportation network that um, allows our city to grow economically and survive in, in its evolution towards higher density, which is, is critical, quite frankly. I mean, we're, we're unique in that we are 640 square miles and we have a very low population density. So we have, we have a real challenge if you think about how do we pay for this city? How do we pay for our infrastructure when our number of taxpayers, our dollars of tax revenue per square mile or per mile of roadway is so low? The higher your density as a city, the greater your resources you have to invest and maintain what you have. And, and we fundamentally, compared to our peers like Chicago and New York and San Francisco, are at a real structural disadvantage. So. Um, we have to engage the population. We know there are over a million and a half people who own bicycles out there. They, uh, if you survey them, they will say, we want to ride more often, uh, but we're concerned. And, and so we have to deliver a, a network and a built environment which encourages people to get out of their house and out of their car and use their bicycles, both for recreation, transportation, and fitness. And in doing so, we will make our city a healthier place 
Um, it'll be a more pleasant place with fewer cars on the road than would be alternatively, and it'll be easier for both people in automobiles as well as those users who want to walk or take their bicycle to get where they're going. So the potential of uniting these, these, these people who are there, who have already spent the money, and, 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 and bring forward their, their vision is, is very exciting, and, and we believe it's going to be it's a great time to do that. Um, with the new administration and the completion of the bicycle master plan, the first one in 20 years, you know, which we're very excited about. So, council member, uh, yes, congratulations again on Thank your you. election. Uh, and so, you have a, a distinct um, um, position in that you're at large, and you don't have to cater to specific groups. And in that, uh, well, <laughs> some some oh, yeah, some man. may argue. Some may argue. I, I might. Yeah. Some may argue, but but for the most part. Um, in what way can you use tools like Mobility Houston um, to, to, to address the issues and to hopefully um, um, supersede some of those uh, individual um, mandates, I guess, so to speak, from different groups uh, and, and kind of tell us about how you feel like this, this next term uh, we'll, you'll be able to, to, to be successful in doing that. Well, um, first of all, I, I think having met Tom before and having worked with Michael in uh, the first year of my, uh, my, my time on city council, I'm much more interested in conversations than arguments. <laughs> um, and I think having met Tom most recently at the last meeting of this past year, 2015's uh, Super Neighborhood Alliance, which is a group uh, that represents uh, communities all across the city. It is a group that I am a past president of. That's two uh, administrations of that organization prior. And um, I, I know what Thomas had to say to the group was really well received. It, it had to do with some of the crowdsourcing strategies that are really baked into the, the theory and the strategy of his organization and, and ones that will let the, the the cream rise to the top of the coffee in this case. I think there's maybe another metaphor that you use to describe the process to, uh, to the Super Neighborhood Alliance. Mm -hmm. That's a group that I know I have heard and truly believe that Mayor Turner is committed uh, to advocating and promoting in the dialogue of the city of Houston. It is something by charter and in terms of chapter 33 of our city of Houston Code of Ordinances is something that is um, is considered to be an advisory capacity to the city council and to mayor. And uh, it's very encouraging to me, and I think should be to these panel um, discussions, um, that the mayor takes very seriously. It is about a multi-jurisdictional collaboration, mm -hmm. and that is all neighborhoods across the city. It is in 11 city council districts. And what I mean by multi-jurisdictional, I'm certainly thinking about Harris County. I'm thinking about the Harris County Flood Control District, which has to do with a huge source of the greening of Houston that's currently going on with the Bayou Greenways Initiative. And that truly touches every uh, district and in ways that I think are providing linkage and you know, linear greenways and parkways that will have us surpassing any city in North America uh, statistically for having the most linear miles of parks and has a truly um, um, uh, noteworthy changing effect on our great city. So I think that that's important. We've got the county, we've got the, the COG, the Council of Governments, in the form of uh, the Houston-Galveston Area Council, which is our planning entity that serves the region. They have a very committed and robust planning and transportation wing, and I think to see them working with the city hand-in-hand hand, um, with bike and planning initiatives to increase mobility, cr create options for those who do not have a car or choose not to have a car and want to walk to work by improving sidewalks and, and bikeways, I think that's very important. And um, there are entities that go down to individual management district and tax increment zones, the TERSAs, that have authority, resources, and jurisdiction over very specific areas of our city and can dovetail in a way that makes true sense with what we have going on. It's Mayor Parker's administration that for the first time passed a comprehensive plan for the city of Houston, general plan uh, of Houston. And that's truly what I think some of these opportunities provide for us in uh, making the sum of the parts greater than uh, the individuals. Yeah, so um, we'll take a, a moment. There's, uh, we have a phone call. Um, 
that's waiting to come in. So. Am I the person waiting? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Thank you for calling. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad this is happening. Well, I have uh, a couple of questions that I wanted to ask about. What do you think about the idea of a mandatory bike registration fee that's not high, just something like 20 bucks for your bike, and then the money goes into the maintenance of the lanes and creating bike lanes and things like that. And then the other, and the other issue, and I'm a cyclist and I live in Montrose, and, um, and I also, when I'm driving at night, I see that it's very difficult sometimes to tell that there's a bike lane. There's no distinction in a color, like a bright orange or, or something that would be no, more no, noticeable because people are not conditioned for lanes here very well. And they're not, the lanes are so narrow to begin with. And then the other thing is, as a driver, I find it really frustrating. There are a lot of cyclists out there who are not wearing proper gear, and we can't see them, and they don't have the proper gear on their light, on their bikes, reflective or lights. And it's, um, it's like the rules don't apply to them. And uh, what can be done to enforce some of that as well? And that's about it. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you uh, for the, the questions, and uh, you kind of – leading into some of the issues that we wanted to address uh, a little bit later on, which was safety, um, which kind of came up in the questions. And because it's bike related, uh, I'll lean <laughs> to you. I, first. I'd love to. Uh, I know you want to hop on take in. A so step, Quentin. For sure, well, definitely. I, I just wonder, uh, what I'd like to know is, are the, are, is there any kind of enforcement, law enforcement, you know, taking the initiative to, to also reprimand or ticket some of the cyclists who are being irresponsible and putting drivers at, at, and their lives at risk as well? Yes, great. Lots of lots of great questions there, and, and you touched on a lot of important issues. I'm just going to take them in the order that, that you you mentioned them. Um, okay. And well, make can sure. Can I hang up? Yes. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Okay. So Thank you for the questions. To make sure I cover Thank them all. You so much. You're welcome. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. So so just taking them sequentially, you you mentioned the possibility of a fee to help fund bicycle activities. Um, we have the advantage and the disadvantage of, of being behind a lot of the other major cities in North America when it comes to developing our built environment and our bicycle infrastructure in particular. And what some other cities have found when they tried to implement registration fees for bicycles as a revenue generation vehicle is that it wasn't as effective as they thought it would be because the cost of administering it and having the staff and the computer systems in place just didn't warrant the, the revenue that was generated. Um, so people have moved away from that across North America and in other countries. Uh, that's not to say that, that, you know, the cycling community is opposed to innovative ways of raising money to, to fund improvements. I think in general people are open to that sort of innovation and that it's critical to really open up the discussion in order to figure out how to, to fund our improvements. So, so going to you know, your second point, which was the quality of the bike lanes and what can we do to improve that really, um, sure. which um, was, it, you know, is, is really what the bike plan is all about. So, so um, we've made a lot of improvement across our country in understanding how to implement safety when it comes to bike lanes, when it comes to protected bike lanes, separated bike lanes, and visibility. And, and, and the, the city public works department, the planning department are, are actually uh, making great strides, I'm pleased to say, in that area when it comes to bringing those sorts of technology to the city. And in the next couple of years, you're gonna see improvements to, to West Alabama, as well as to TC Jester and other streets, uh, which bring some of these new technologies forward. But, um, you're right, the visibility is a key issue. It relates to the lanes as well as to the users. The law is that, that riders need to um, be visible. They need to have a light and a, at least a reflective uh, reflector on the back of their bicycle. And I think, you know, if there's a point I can lead, leave with the listeners tonight, it is you please use common sense whenever you're going out in a low light environment. Wear reflective clothing, wear light colored clothing, and make sure your batteries are good in your light and that it's all working properly. Is your, your life and your safety depends on that, and that's, that's really critical. Uh, I'll pick yeah. up on that. Yeah. You know, as a long term cyclist, I will say the, uh, you know, the behavior that we uh, provide as an example to the community is of utmost importance. We need to be good citizen <coughs> riders, and um, it, it, 
it is something that I preach now as someone who not only is a father and requires my family to wear helmets uh, like I do, yet we also need to be conscientious. You know, those who follow the rules as drivers of automobiles want to know, you know, why uh, tickets are not issued to the cycling community that flaunts the law. And that makes it very, very difficult for those of us who are trying to provide a better environment for our community of cyclists. Um, and maybe you can pick up on that in a yeah. moment. I did want to speak briefly about the infrastructure in, that we're, we're building in the city. And I know that um, there is a new, to the city of Houston, a couple year old now, um, commitment to complete streets and what that can do. It is, uh, I think, a Houston specific solution that we're coming towards. I don't think it's been fully realized yet by any stretch, but we're, we're beginning to build some of the ideas inherent in, in that um, set of concepts um, that we need to promote with our engineers and traffic planners. Um, to build into those street improvements that are coming along as we repair potholes and we restructure streets and redesign things. So that, that is a matter of policy. It is a matter that I bring with great seriousness to the table and the horseshoe at City Hall. Um, I, I think I'd refer again to the Quality of Life Committee as well as the Transportation Technology and Infrastructure Committee where we're looking at, among other things, a very important document called the IDM, the Infrastructure De Design Manual, and that is the, the toolbox, the kit of parts that we have to build better streets, and whether that is designated bike lanes or ones that are separated by landscaping elements, just there are safer ways to illuminate bike paths and create the infrastructure that can surround safer transit. And I think the, the sooner we get to a plan about where to locate these streets and begin to preach to the folks um, who can begin to respect the community of good riders and understand the value, it's, it's going to be a great win for the city. Maybe. So, so just one second um, before you kind of go into something else. I, I do, because it's important, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about, is getting feedback from our viewers uh, and for people in the, in the Houston area. Uh, for direct feedback and, and to, to, to in, input, uh, go to mobilityhouston.com, M-O-B-I-L-I-T-Y, Houston.com. Um, and you can uh, join and engage in the conversation there as well. So to kind of pick back up um, on, uh, on, on, I guess, another topic here, uh, we've just had elections, right? I mean, everybody's aware of that, and we're going into another election year. Um, what do you think um, these elections and the new administration uh, coming in, how will transportation uh, play as far as uh, its role in the order of things uh, to, to be addressed. I mean, you know, there are a lot of things talked about on the campaign trail. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, transportation wasn't very high on the list. Uh, so how does that fit in to going forward um, and trying to get these initiatives taken, for, taken hold? Well, let me say that as far as I can tell, the first order that I've seen uh, Mayor Turner do uh, since the inauguration this past Monday is um, instruct a, a new policy that has to do with uh, pothole uh, alleviation. So it, that that by itself is transportation okay. related. So All I right. think that's right. good. Um, he's made quite a commitment. So I, you know, I'm excited about it. I hope it works. If we can get our potholes uh, addressed in 24 hours, he, he he's very careful. I think the administration is about choosing the right vocabulary. <laughs> We're not going to fix every pothole, but we will assess every pothole uh, that's properly. Um, uh, brought to the attention of the city within 24 hours. And then there is a metric, I think, of the full policy for which he has uh, suggested that within two weeks we will be hearing the way that that will go forward. But he, in a letter again today that he's issued through Citizen Net, uh, the Houston, um, uh, I guess we call that what? the Distribution, email distribution. Right, that, that can really help us um, you know, advocate for policy in the city, that, that's, he's, he's committed to this two-week agenda that can help us relate to, you know, that's the pothole in my street that needs to be fixed. So citywide, he's encouraging all Houstonians mm -hmm. to come in and say, let's fix it. I love the idea of this kind of immediate triage, and um, as a neighborhood advocate, um, I'm, I'm eager to see it succeed. Okay, and I want to comment? Well, I, I mean, from, from our perspective, you know, the, 
the condition of the roads is critical to the safety of people that ride bicycles. So fixing potholes is, is, is actually uh, highly valued by the cycling community. And you know, we, we take the, the citizens' election of Mayor Turner as a sign that people uh, want to have an elected official who takes transportation seriously for all sorts of people. And, and, and we know, you know Houston is um, unfortunately in a situation where 24% of our population live at poverty level or below. You know, that's $24,000 a year for a family of four people. A lot of people don't realize how little money that is. And the fact that you can't really own a car mm -hmm. and maintain a car for that amount of income if you have four four people in your house, so so you know we see the use of of bicycles and public transportation and walking is critical to the quality of life for a major segment of our population. Not just that population, but even if you're twice poverty level, you know you, you're 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 um, in a situation where saving money is really quite uh, an important aspect of life. It, so no, so we that, that speaks, uh, I think, to the conversation that Thomas had mm -hmm. with Mobility Houston when he came to the Super Neighborhood Alliance, because that was where some of the communities Michael is referring to have so little. Some have yeah. no sidewalks. They don't have a shoulder on the side of the road. We're talking about streets with ditches, drainage ditches, you know, not a safe place to ride a bicycle. Absolutely. And this is community-wide in some of these places. So my hope is that citizens in those communities are going to be among those who really pay attention to the opportunity to let their concerns Absolutely. rise to the top of those that we share in Houston. Bringing it to those communities that have the least uh, transportation options and where Bike Houston I think has been a leader in, in advocating for less served communities. I'm very excited about what that can mean. Absolutely. You know, better parks, but better bike opportunities. And I think the crowdsourcing opportunity here is to, to have that proved out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the priority of Mobility Houston, and Michael, you touched on it, right? Sometimes Houston can be a tale of two cities a little bit, especially 24% of the population living under the poverty line. You know, I think one of the goals of Mobility Houston, what we can really accomplish is get into those communities where they have these truly desperate quality of life issues, right? No sidewalks, no bike lanes. And we know that that mobility, how we get around from point A to point B, be it work or school or play, is, is not only important to quality of life, but it's also important to upwards mobility. It's important to how people lift themselves up out of those situations as well. And that's why we're so excited to hopefully, well, not hopefully, we are bringing this conversation to Houston. We're going to bring it to all of these corners where this conversation, where no one's really asked these folks before, right. what, what, what should we do to make, improve the quality of life in this neighborhood? And, and I think this leads into a, a, another interesting point that I think we've kind of been touching on a little bit. And Michael, you brought it up already. One and a half million bicycles in mm -hmm. Houston. Right. That's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. It's a great opportunity. How do we, and I guess, and, and council member, you wanted to talk about collaboration. I guess what I'm really wondering is how can private entities like Bike Houston and public entities like city council and public works and what have you collaborate together to get those bicycles on the road? Right. Well, I, I th I'll point to one program that's in parallel with Bike Houston, and that's the city's B-Cycle program, mm -hmm. uh, which has had some pretty enormous success in its first year in, Tremendous in some time. And we understand that the that the organization is really doubling down on the number of bikes that's being that are being purchased, the locations where these destinations are to be distributed around town. I think it was just announced that uh, both the campuses of TSU as well as the main uh, University of Houston campus are about to receive some of these destination hubs, um, which is a way with, uh, I'm thinking of those two universities with the Columbia Tap and the way that that bike trail has immediate access in downtown Houston and with fairly good now routes into the Texas Medical Center. Mm -hmm. Not only are those opportunities for recreation and a healthier lifestyle, some great opportunities for biking and seeing the city, but it really provides access to job opportunities. Right. And so that kind of um, you know economic and social mobility becomes inherent and baked into the opportunities provided by the program. Right. I, I mean, I think what's exciting about HoustonMobility.com is that it is a a channel that people can use. It's it's a vehicle that people can use to 
bring their ideas forward. You may have missed the election. You may not have voted. It doesn't matter at this point. What matters is that we engage with our elected officials. And cities evolve when, when people get engaged in the process. So, you know, Bike Houston, through our website, bikehouston.com, is registering people that own bicycles. We're collecting their zip codes so that we can share with the city council where people live, who care about these issues. By going to houstonmobility.com, you can engage in the conversation and share your questions, your concerns, and your ideas that will ultimately be shared with our elected officials, with our civic leaders who are making investment decisions around the future of our city. And so, you know, what's fundamental to, the, to, to change is people have to take a small step. They have to mm -hmm. personally engage in one way or another. And, and this tool, this technology, this website is a easy, free way for the people watching this show today to go log on HoustonMobility.com and Mobility Houston. Mobility Houston. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's so yeah, no, that's important. MobilityHouston.com. We should have that behind our heads. <laughs> um, it you know to to engage in the process and help shape the future of our city. Absolutely. So so like we just mentioned Mobility Houston, and one of the things that I do want to touch on is other means because you mentioned potholes, transportation. Uh, people uh, move about um, by more ways than just bike. Mm, uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I think going forward uh, that we have to look at as a, a city is being able to understand how to effectively move people in and out of the city as well as around the city. Uh, so um, we talked about poverty level. Uh, we talked about different things. But so a couple of things I want to touch on is um, uh, metro. Uh, and bus and public transportation. Public transportation, for sure. So if you could just touch a, a minute well, on that as well. It, it's good, and uh, in the way of speaking to that, I think related again to some of the topics we've already talked about, where some of the major thoroughfares have perhaps been most rutted by traffic and most stricken with potholes. You know, as it turns out, some of the worst conditions, of course, are right at the edge of the road, where bicycles tend to travel, where mm -hmm. curbs decompose and fall into the street and and simple things like having proper maintenance uh, to rebuild those things or to clean a big chunk of concrete out of a out of the way of an oncoming bike not that bikes should be on those major thoroughfares but to find the proper routes and I think that's what the the bike plan Houston is about is finding the appropriate place for these bikes to go within our communities. But getting them around the city, to your question, I think that's where we have to uh, partner again with the other huge jurisdictional authority, um, and that's Metro. And it is, I think to their credit, the great um, bike racks that they've been putting on all their bikes, the, mm -hmm. the huge number of riders uh, that are already there, but within the last year, I think we've heard today that over the past calendar year, there's been an 11% increase in ridership uh, on mes metro bus routes mm -hmm. and that's um, during the period in which they've changed a huge portion of their service to embrace the so-called uh, reimagining process uh, which is a streamline and efficiency operation for the city of Houston so uh, those routes are becoming more efficient they are better for providing access to communities and destination workplaces um, for riders and in this case, I think that's natural. We need to make sure that we have some of the bike stations and the bike stops near to where one can ride and find a destination near to a metro stop within good walking distance. And then from the bus stop home, have a good sidewalk to get you near, near mm -hmm. to your house. Right. And, and I think that's one of the most exciting pieces of Houston policymaking right now. Houston's in a, a unique position with the adoption of Plan Houston uh, late last year and now with the bicycle master plan process that's underway. Houston is, uh, is poised to really start putting together multiple different layers of planning and, and to start fitting together a transportation system that really is holistic, that works for automobiles, that works for cyclists, that works for pedestrians, and that works for transit users. And making sure that all of these different parts are, are working together in an effective way. And, and I think that uh, Houston's really kind of at a, a blank canvas moment right now, right? And I know, I'm, I'm, Michael, I'm sure you're excited about the Bicycle Master Plan and how this can begin to start putting pieces together of how all of these different jurisdictions, how all these different ride providers, be it B-Cycle, Metro, or otherwise, can begin to work together uh, to create a more efficient system. And right. Before you answer anything, we do have another, uh, another call uh, coming in. Hi, I'm the same person that called earlier. 
I have I have another question regarding the bus riding. I noticed that like um, in front of the li Montrose Library on Montrose, there's a covered seating area there while you wait for the bus. Yet directly across the street, going north, there's nothing. And I see this all over the city where there's a lot of uncovered areas where people are forced to stand in direct sun and sometimes, you know, poor weather conditions. And is there a plan to provide a proper seating covered area at, at all the bus stops? Okay. Short answer is yes. Uh, not that I'm a spokesperson for Metro, but I know it is certainly part of the intention of the organization to get better coverage and better sidewalks from the routes to the neighborhoods. So, uh, you know, uh, fortunately the answer is yes. What time frame, what resources are allocated for that, I can't say that I'm, I'm up to the immediate policy future of that, but the good news is that we're told it is. I, I think both Michael and I have pointed to the huge size of Houston with 640 square miles. So, you know, this is a, a great challenge for, um, you know, providing comprehensive coverage for all Houstonians, but it is an objective. Well, I think um, I would assume that it's going to help with getting more bus riders as well, uh, because I have a couple of friends who are actually using the bus and, and really um, pleased with the results that they're getting. So Good. Anyway, I thought I'd throw that in, too. Thank you. Well, thank you for the call. Just one small point to build on some of the comments earlier that David made relating to Metro. Uh, we've heard from Metro recently that one of the fastest growing segment, the fastest growing segment of their ridership um, are the people that use both their bicycle and, and Metro. And, and so, um, you know, we're, we're excited about that. We've seen the graphs over the last three years. I know they're excited about that. And, and I just want to encourage people to give it a try. You see those racks, they pull down. The first time you do it, it takes you know 20 seconds to figure it out, but they're very easy and they're very secure. So uh, you know, give it a try if you hadn't done it. And we and we've talked about different things going forward, uh, um, but how, uh, council member, in your opinion, uh, with so many different projects going on, um, how could the different entities and organizations come together uh, to maximize their efforts? Well, I think one thing is Mobility Houston. Let me go ahead and plug my friend Thomas. <laughs> Absolutely. Because um, I, I do want to encourage everyone to get on this website. But as he has spoken about what we're doing with Plan Houston, I know that uh, fortunately that uh, initiative has had a truly robust set of stakeholders, uh, in, uh, an incredibly vital uh, steering committee and a technology committee that is composed of experts who are both city employees, mm -hmm. metro employees, various people from across the city um, and county and I think the jurisdictional authorities that we're speaking of. Um, I assume Bike Houston has been involved with the Plan Houston yes. project. Please confirm that for Correct. me. Correct. We have. Very good. Uh, steering community committee, stakeholder community. Yes, all of the above. We're, both. We're excited, <laughs> and and the bike plan that is coming right at the same time, which will dovetail right into it. You know? There, there's as Quentin, you can understand. There's a lot of cross pollination with these organizations in our community. We are, I think, a very resourceful. Uh, grassroots set of communities. I'm now lucky to be a council member representing all of Houston, but I am essentially a civic club leader that uh, got promoted to the Super Neighborhood Alliance and the Planning Commission, and now I'm on council. So with uh, this authority, I can say um, with confidence that the new administration shares um, interest mm -hmm. and uh, um, is, is very much watching for the greatest potential to come from this collaboration. So we're working with all possible folks to make this happen. And, and I think one of the wonderful things about Plan Houston was it really laid the groundwork both for council, for grassroots, as well as for the planning department and Director Walsh to, to begin that cross-pollination in a much bigger way and to start going across departments and across grassroots groups to, to start producing plans uh, for all of these modes of transit, be it be it bikes or otherwise. And if you haven't read Plan Houston, you, you should go do it. It's an amazing document. There's a lot of white space in that document. And I think that white space is very intentional. Very it's deep. a lot it's a lot of blank space for, for council and for grassroots to begin to, to come together and, and start building on that framework that y'all laid out last year. Framework where, is the word. And where just 
perchance, would you go to see Plan Houston? Council member, I just heard <laughs> City of Houston uh, Planning Department on the city's home website page. Look for the Planning Department and look for Bike Houston uh, and Plan Houston. Plan Houston. And uh, those two documents, I think, are really a framework document mm -hmm. that are looking to plug in all components. There is um, a lot of empty space for filling in the blanks. Mm -hmm. It was meant not to be a comprehensive document, but something that all parties involved could buy into with the prospect of making Houston better. And comprehensive in that regard, but I think a formidable document in the way that, you know, up until recently, uh, planning has really not been very no. much in the vocabulary of the city of Houston. I've been on the planning commission for quite a while and it's been in place for a long time, but I think we're really uh, I will give Mayor Parker credit for, um, you know, in, in engaging a Parks Master Plan and a General Plan for the city, the Bikes Master Plan, Arts and Culture Master Plan. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've got a legacy that I think she's created that uh, Mayor Turner w has every right and reason to build on. And I think there are enough of us and plenty of us on council and throughout the community that we're committed to that prospect and and going to do it. Yeah. Is just just to sort of help the viewers also think about the, the you know the the general plan as a framework upon which we can build the the bike plan which is a year long process and will be completed in the next 4 months or so is one of these uh, sub segments or layers if you will that's being tied into the general plan which it's very important to have public engagement on. Mm -hmm. And if you want more information on the bike plan you can go to bikehouston.org and you can get those updates, you can engage in the process. And that's very important in terms of having your feedback for our city council members, for the planning department and public works about how the bike plan specifically will address your community, your neighborhood. And we'll be coming out with a draft uh, map as well as policies. We've already set goals to become a gold level city in the next 10 years. And so, you know, getting people's engagement and their thoughts on that is really important to, to the process going forward as well. If I can add a couple other groups that I think have been pivotal to the planning agenda in, in the city of Houston, I think uh, one has to point to Blueprint Houston, who's had as part of their component of their mission statement, the embracing of a general plan and comprehensive plan for the city of Houston. So all credit where it's due with that group, as well as with uh, Houston Tomorrow. Uh, uh, great folks over there, including my friend Jay Crossley, the executive director currently, who has a concept that is in many ways parallel to the Bayou Greenways initiative, where he's talking for uh, 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 neighborhood bikeway greenways. Um, forgive me, Jay, if I've got the name wrong, but we go to uh, HoustonTomorrow.com and look at the uh, neighborhood bikeways plans. And this is, you know, it, it goes dovetailing uh, with the city of Houston, um, where to put the streets, where to put access and safer routes for cyclists in our community, and what we need to do to up the, up the game on how to provide appropriate infrastructure for that safe uh, passage, protected access, intersections designed in ways where there is the proper signalization, there's the right materials and safeguards. Um, there's, there's been a tremendous movement across the United States and in Europe and in Asia where uh, details are not private. They're public realm uh, sourced information that we can, we can benefit from science and technology and infrastructure that is um, practically universal. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of touch on some of the advantages of having a mobility used in site, there's some feedback on currently uh, on the site that I just want to <laughs> kind of highlight. Uh, one of the uh, persons posted, uh, there's no way the city can keep up with growth by building more roads. We've tried that and it did not work. I think the focus uh, should be on expanding uh, rail to outskirts uh, of the city. And so uh, I, what I want to touch on is um, when we talk about planning, uh, we talking about, we're talking about thinking outside of our normal means of transportation. So I'd like to just take a minute to talk about feasibility uh, on expanding rail. And on top of that, uh, expanding uh, bike trails to neighboring uh, communities. So we talk about expansion uh, both in physical means and uh, geographic means as well. 
let me take the first stab at sure. it just because I think among other things we now have the interurban um, rail that's being proposed so you know we can get down to local discussions about rail we can get uh, to commuter rail discussions we have interurban rail between here and Dallas um, being discussed now so there is all kinds of levels and scales of mobility and transportation planning that are going on and wouldn't it be nice if you could take your bike on each and every one of those medium um, and modalities. Um, in, in this case I think where the road builders are uh, most stressed right now frankly is with the dramatic population increase that continues to come and uh, as Houston... Which is a good thing. It, it's a high-class problem, as we say, right, in many ways, yet um, I think our history and our tendency has been to continue to build at the edges of our city. Sprawl comes to mind, and what one has to do in terms of reaching those folks in the new communities um, is provide infrastructure, and that is a very delicate balance that needs to be considered in check, and I think um, where we in a local jurisdictional authority have responsibility for working with Metro and other governmental entities to keep our streets and roads uncongested and flowing as smoothly as possible. We have tools at our disposal to make that happen. We do very much need to continue to work with our congressional delegation, and that's both senators and representatives. <laughs> um, in instances, I think I would call uh, to mind two friends from the legislature, both uh, Senator Rodney Ellis and State Representative Jim Murphy, who worked together um, recently to open up some of the public utility corridors to provide further access both within the city of Houston and beyond. And while we have this incredible uh, Bayou Greenway initiative that voters uh, passed in a, in a um, impressively uh, consensus building majority, we now have the opportunity to connect in really a different direction of our urban grid, where you think about the bayous that tend to flow from the northwest to the southeast toward Galveston Bay and the bayou um, and the Gulf Coast. We have utility lines that are essentially providing across axes to those bayous. And as they've been opened up to keep folks from having liability issues if they were to fall or um, have some kind of injury within the corridor, those are now places where the utilities can allow for infrastructure to be placed and we have further points of access and potential as seen with some of what's going on very much in the center of Houston with Memorial Park and uh, I believe it's the Union Pacific right-of-way that cuts through. I may be wrong, but it is the one uh, I'll call my friend... Uh, MKT right. Trail, uh, maybe? Well, it's the or Welcome region. Wilson Trail that I'm thinking okay. about, the one that uh, goes south through Memorial Park and cuts across oh, San Felipe, right, right, Westheimer, right, 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 right. Yes. and Richmond. So it's, yes. it's an important cross-axial That's going to be exciting. That is very exciting. So uh, lots to come in that regard. Um, but I share the concern of the <laughs> author of that about yeah. um, unmitigated growth in the city. Sure. So I uh, would just want to take a moment. Uh, we have another caller. All right. How you doing, fellas? Hey, good. how's it going? Good, good. Uh, good stuff. Definitely uh, interesting information. Um, I was wondering if you all feel that car sharing companies uh, like Zipcar can fit into making Houston a safer place for bikers. Zipcar. Okay. Yeah. Uber, Zipcar, Lyft, so forth? Well, exactly. I, it's certainly a safer. I, I mean, I think, you know, from our perspective, car sharing is a great technology which creates options for people who don't want to sink lots of money into an asset that just sits in one place most of the day and gets used for very small amounts of time over the years that it depreciates. So, so we're enthusiastic about car sharing technologies, combining cycling with walking, cycling with public transportation, cycling with, with taxi cabs, whatever you want to choose. Um, in terms of making it safer for people who are out there, I think it encourages people to um, use multi modes of transportation. And in that sense, it reduces the number of cars on the road because more people choose other things. And in that sense, it makes it safer. And certainly, 
uh, we're, we're glad to see the option out there. Yeah, having alternatives is really the key, I think. So um, as we last year on city council voted a policy initiative to permit Uber, we're still working with that to make sure that it's a safe and well-regulated uh, modality. But I agree with Michael, we've got to look at um, you know everything from walking on a sidewalk to uh, the inner urban rail, and that's everything and all of the above. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you for all your hard work and uh, looking forward to some new bike lanes in the you know, downtown and Montrose area. All right. Thank you for the call. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the call. So, uh, you know, we have uh, some few minutes left. And there's one thing uh, that you can't help but talk about when you talk about transportation, and that's uh, the environmental impact. So, and that's another thing that I wanted to kind of touch on. Um, I just heard a statistic coming across that last year was record sales uh, for trucks. And so we know that as price, oil prices go up, people want a car share, their carpool, uh, which helps in congestion. Uh, but when we look at prices now in the Houston economy with oil, um, and obviously more people opting to buy trucks and larger vehicles, uh, it's going to be an impact on fuel efficiency and on exhausts. And, um, and, uh, and so the question is, um, what because in, in just recently I thought there were some maybe you can add on this is there was an ordinance about idling for public vehicles right uh, so just kind of touch on if you could uh, the transportation impact and initiatives that council uh, might have or you would push going forward to minimize uh, the negative effects uh, of the environmental impact and, and transportation well, this is Texas, and uh, I am a truck owner. I, I own a smaller truck, so I will tell you I'm an, an architect and, and do a lot of construction. So I, I utilize my truck and okay. probably will have a hard time parting with it. But at the same time, the idling order, ordinance that you refer to did come before the Quality of Life Committee. And uh, in that regard, we looked at it very carefully as something that is affecting neighborhoods. In this case, I will point very specifically to the museum uh, neighborhood, super neighborhood, the museum district super neighborhood that was having a, a problem uh, foment in their, in their region there that um, with all the school buses that go to the Houston Children's Museum and the Museum of Natural Science and other institutions in, in their near vicinity, they got problems with just uh, the school buses that are there and for without a real great reason were keeping, uh, keeping the motor running and creating some pretty foul air conditions. So a lot of smart folks got together to try to think about an appropriate policy that could keep, you know, the smog production there down and minimize that without, as it came out in the deliberations, without creating a whole lot of problems for safety or vehicles that really, as it turns out, need to remain on in case there is an emergency. You know, there are times when uh, ambulances and firefighters, you would not want them to turn off their vehicle while they're waiting for a response that they know is imminent. We need to be careful about that, and there are school buses with similar situations. But, um, for instance, working with the Port of Houston, that was a, an important aspect of the discussions uh, before our committee about what what do we do with all those 18 wheelers that are trying to get in and out of the port and how can we help them minimize some of the issues that are going on uh, to keep things safe to keep our air clean we, we know enough from what's going on with both national as well as international discussions now that our air quality is uh, both a local a regional a national and in some cases global. international or global issue so uh, we've got to do our part I think for us to both regulate our local environment as well as enforce policy is appropriate um, we need to take cues from all the appropriate authorities having a jurisdiction but and sure. we can make money in the process I mean Houston's a non-attainment zone when it comes to ozone and certain types of other um, pollutants which restricts federal dollars flowing into our economy into our infrastructure development process. So, so I mean, by cleaning up Good our point. city, we not only address our health and our children's health, but, and we make it a more pleasant place to exercise, which makes us want to do it more, which makes us healthier, but we're also bringing more money in. So, so, you know, when someone says we can't afford to put a bike lane in, the reality is we've tried it for 20 years without them and we can't afford to keep doing what we're doing because we're, we're, we're not meeting our environmental standards, we're losing out on dollars, and we've created an environment where people say, I don't feel safe getting out of my house and my car, 
and we have two thirds of our society which is now struggling with with health related conditions. As and, and many of us are still sitting in traffic as well. Indeed. So go to mobilityhouston.com. <laughs> Absolutely. Engage in the conversation. Ask for something different. Now, I, you go ahead. I, I think smog and uh, congestion continues to be a very high priority for mm -hmm. those uh, who answer uh, questionnaires about uh, the worst problems facing Houston. So I think this is uh, a great opportunity uh, to weigh in Absolutely. and respond uh, through this organization? It, it, I mean, it's really, we, we want and we hope to host a conversation with elected officials, with advocates, and with the general public about w what do you want Houston to look like, and what is a Houston that you want to live in? And uh, frankly, for better or worse, decisions are made by those who show up. So we, we hope that folks show up at mobilityhouston.com. We hope that folks show up at the ballot box in the future to, to make their voice heard on these critical issues. Tom, you mentioned when you visited the Super Neighborhood Alliance that you would be available I'm, to I'm meet here. <laughs> uh, with anyone who would have you. Can I tee you up to maybe make a plug for that? A absolutely, please. Uh, my email address is thomas at glasshousepolicy.org. Uh, email me. I will come and meet with you. I will come and sit in your living room, council member, and talk to whoever you want about this important conversation that we're hosting. We're really excited about it. It's a great opportunity, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from in the Houston region, to, to make your voice heard, no matter how crazy of an idea it is, or even if it's a simple idea, you want a stop sign on your street corner, please, uh, mobilityhouston.com is the place to, to make these opinions heard. And it's also the place where we're gonna start to build on that framework in Plan Houston. It's where we're gonna start talking about the bicycle master plan and how we can fit all of these things together to make Houston a more livable city. And let me return to that point one more time. Where I met you was at the Super Neighborhood yes. Alliance. You did say that you'd come out to any Super Neighborhood Anyone. group or a civic club. Uh, and I think that this is a great opportunity uh, to make that um, part of your local community's mm -hmm. priority. Tell your super neighborhood officers that you'd like Thomas to come and get on an agenda. We've got a, a few minutes left and I do want to, uh, to cater. There's another phone call, so we'd like to hear what you have to say. Uh, well, I want to ask about the, the utility vehicles that are sitting around idling for long periods of time and the people are either in the car or not. And I'm in the first Montrose Commons area where they're doing re-cable uh, the under the streets, new gas lines, new water and sewage. And these vehicles, I notice that sometimes uh, some of the people, they'll be waiting for a, a tool or machinery to come for several hours, and uh, they'll just be sitting in their cars and trucks running them. And is that legal and okay? And, and if so, why? Okay, so... Um what Thank is you, the city going to do a, about that? I'll, got a few, yeah, a few I'll take seconds. a try on it. Um, Thank you for the call, by the way. Appreciate Thanks. that question. I think um, the group that rolled out the idling ordinance that Quentin referred to is the Administration and Regulatory Affairs Department with the city of Houston. I could direct you to them um, without knowing specific names and numbers. I would also offer uh, my office at City Hall as a resource to you. So that's um, uh, at large two. Uh, city Council and my telephone number is uh, 832-393-3013. Ask my staff um, about your concern and we will take that to the appropriate uh, folks to answer it. Yeah, it's so great. Uh, so I, wanna, I want to uh, thank uh, all our guests, uh, Thomas, uh, Mike, and council member. Uh, we really do appreciate you joining in with us. Uh, and, um, and, and engaging in a discussion. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters Houston and Houston Media Source, I want to thank you for joining our public affairs, public access, and uh, we definitely invite you to tune in next time.